Okay, so let's uh, let's start. I have updated the the wiki page. Who who has still problems with the wiki or the Discord? So hopefully everyone is on Discord and on the wiki. Uh, there were a couple of people asking about the morning session. So the morning session doesn't happen normally unless there is something unexpected. So sometimes, for example, the lecturers cannot come on Thursday, so we will do few, uh, Wednesday morning session. Uh, but normally the 8.15 session is like just for you to work in groups. Um, so we will not use it. Uh, we will use this session and tomorrow's session. Uh, sometimes we will swap, so we have lecture today, but more kind of a hands-on tomorrow. Sometimes the hands-on will be on Wednesday and the lecture will be on Thursday. So it kind of depends how, how the progression happens. Um, I would like you to uh, watch some videos before the lecture, so then I don't need to repeat it, but we can spend some time discussing some more advanced things from the topics. Um, I haven't posted anything before this lecture, so I will kind of use this to talk. Uh, but from next week on, I will try to post the actual lecture video before the lecture. And then we spend the, the time here to kind of discuss more instead of me just talking. Um, I hope it will work quite well. Um, we will see how it goes. So I posted... Um, I posted stuff for the next weeks. Where is the... Yeah. Um, so there is quite a lot of stuff today, uh, posted for today, which we will not cover. It's Java, um, and um, I, I will talk a little bit about Java, but not to the depth that it's on the videos. So I would like you to watch the first video that the last from last year, and then uh, you can also watch the Java conventions, uh, but I will cover the conventions a little bit today as well. Um, and then there are like two guides for uh, learning Java. Those of you who never had Java before, you will have more work. Those of you who already know Java, of course, you, you, you just, it's a refresher. Um, so those who don't know Java, you, I encourage you to kind of follow more thorough the videos and uh, the guides. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about this in a moment. What I will spend the rest of the lecture today is this part, which is kind of for next week. Uh, so I turn it around. So I will talk a little bit about Android and what the components are and so on. So what will happen is um, I will talk about the theory about Android programming today. Tomorrow you will have Kotlin and you will do some hands-on with uh, Android Studio using Kotlin. And those of you who never had Java before, you will watch the videos and you will kind of refresh yourself, those who had Java. Uh, and then we come back to this, to this next week, right? So instead of me spending this week discussing all the details, I want you to watch the videos for next week and we will cover the parts which are kind of missing from, from here or that you have questions, okay? Um, but I will kind of uh, briefly talk about the conventions. Um, programming conventions, because they, they are kind of uh, general and uh, um, they are applicable to Java and to Kotlin and to other languages that, that we use. Um, so that's the kind of organization of the, of the wiki. I've also added some um, example um, exercises that you can use to one, once you're refreshing Java or once you're um, learning Kotlin. So the first one is basic programs. That's the easiest one. Then we have a, har a little bit harder program examples here. And we have kind of a basic UI exercises for the labs uh, in here. So those are very short. So this is like, um, you know, um, very simple. Some of them are very simple, like generate hello application with the fab button um, or make the fab button do something. So th this is basically done in the lab. You can do that in the lab using Kotlin and kind of play with those. So those are kind of a simple um, activities that you can kind of do with the GUI, with the Android Studio. So that should be pretty straightforward to go through. Um, and then the programming ones, you can do them on your own. What we did last year was uh, we had uh, students doing uh, pull requests with some basic programs, same as we did for uh, cloud, um, into the, the project repo. 
and then you can give your solutions to, to some of those, right? So, of course, we have reverse string. Why do we learn how to reverse a string by hand? Um, we don't learn, we just kind of use it as a kind of a tool to practice something, to practice writing methods, to practice writing control flow and so on, right? You don't need to know how to do certain things, but you have to use something to kind of train yourself, to remind yourself of how to do things, right? Uh, so, for example, reversing a string or fizz, fizz bus are completely useless activities. There are kind of methods to do that in most programming languages. We just use them as a kind of an exercise, right? Um, so there is a reversing a string, a fizz bus, uh, and reading a file and counting the words in, in the file. Uh, so those are kind of a simple ones. The more advanced ones are kind of uh, using higher level um, functions, for example, lambdas, using inner classes, or um, doing kind of an object-oriented switch statement. So instead of saying switch, or if something is of particular type, in an object-oriented fashion, we usually use a kind of a pattern which does it for us without the, the uh, explicit if statement. So this exercise is about like learning how to do that. Uh, and of course, dealing with JSON. So those of you who did cloud, you already know how to deal with JSON using Golang. Uh, so just practice it using Java or Kotlin. Um, so what will happen is you kind of do that in your own time at home if you want to. You can submit pull requests if you want to. And then in about two weeks time, I will kind of go over those exercises and we will discuss them in the class a little bit. Um, so especially the basic Android UI and the basic uh, programs. So it's like a lot of material kind of posted here, but this is kind of spread for the next two to three weeks. So it's not all this week, it's kind of uh, more than we need for this week. And as I said, we kind of uh, postponing the discussion on Java after you, you listen to the videos. Uh, why we discuss Java? Why we just don't do Kotlin? Um, it helps to know how, how Java works and what is kind of how the JVM operates to understand uh, Kotlin a little bit more. And I think they're kind of related. So Kotlin is like a superset of Java. So everything you kind of uh, doing in Java is it will work in Kotlin too. Um, but uh, Kotlin is more succinct, is kind of a more expressive. So that's why it's nicer to use it for programming on Android. So beyond those two first weeks, most of the examples and discussions which we'll have about coding will use Kotlin. Um, but those of you who never had Java, it kind of is worthwhile to, to refresh it. That's why we have it here. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, what I will do first, I will kind of go over the skill survey. So we had this kind of a link here and I ask you to um, fill in the, the survey about your current skills so then we can fine tune the course to fit you better. Uh, so I have the kind of the, re the results here so we can uh, check it out. So the first question was, do you have a $1 million mobile app idea? So, you know, every fifth of you have, so to speak, or six. So anyway, like 12, 12 and a half percent. Um, so uh, some of you do, most don't. That was a kind of a more of a fun question. Um, how easy is mobile programming? What do you think? So most of you think it's easier than graphics. So graphics tend to be kind of perceived as a hard course. Uh, and then Unity Unreal sort of 40%, uh, so 50-50. And then uh, shouldn't be easier than the cloud. Uh, so eight, only 18 people, 18%. Um, percent. Um, I don't know, like, I think mobile is harder than, um, than cloud because there is more moving parts. Uh, in the cloud, you can constrain yourself to kind of a subset and only deal with that subset. In mobile, you can't do that because of, of the nature of the platform. You have to deal with the small screen. You have to deal with the limited storage. You have to deal with network going up and down. You can't really say, well, let's not consider that. You kind of need to consider everything. You need to deal with versions, with the devices you have. Um, even 
if you uh, develop a perfectly working application and you've tested it and you have tests and everything works fine, um, in the cloud if you deploy it, especially if you deploy it using um, Docker or some kind of uh, containers that you have full control of, it will work. You can kind of guarantee it will work. On Android or on iOS, on iOS not so much, but on Android, if you have a working app and you put it in the App Store and some uh, unusual device gets it and tries to run it, it may have problems because you haven't considered some of the resolution aspects or some things kind of are rendered differently. So most often than not, you have to fine tune kind of a fully working app. Um, so from experience, like I, I develop a simple app that I've tested on uh, maybe six different devices. And then I spent maybe 80% of my time fixing it for everybody else to kind of actually work and render properly and, and do what it's supposed to do. Um, so it, it, I don't know, it, it, is, it feels a little bit more complex, uh, possibly. How motivated you guys are for the course? Yeah, it's kind of um, in the upper side. Some people are kind of in the middle, but most people are motivated. So you're here because you want to be here, which is good. Uh, what programming languages do you have experience with? Um, so this is uh, a little bit interesting because historically it is changing. Uh, in the past, we have quite heavy PHP and C++ skew. Um, we didn't have much Java, C Sharp, uh, or kind of a Go Python combo. Now, because uh, first years, especially with the data engineers and so on, some of them have Python and Python became much more popular. There is quite a big bump with Go and Python, um, almost reaching the same levels as uh, C++. So like we, as you've seen, the course is sort of like um, Java programming for C, C++ developers. We probably should have one for like Go or Python developers. <laughs> um, so <coughs> it is kind of changing, but it's good to see that um, that some of the languages like Kotlin are completely unpopular. So you will all you all will learn a new programming language, which is good. Um, yeah, we kind of are lacking this a little bit. So with the, some of the courses like advanced programming, we're trying to upskill people with uh, C++ uh, 17 and now 19, the latest uh, um, revisions of the languages. Okay, what do you use? GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab? Yeah, predictably skewed towards GitHub. Uh, preferred IDEs. So Visual Studio Code, the most popular one. Atom, also very popular. Yeah, hardcore Vim user, single person. PyCharm, Sublime Text. Yeah, as I was saying in the first lecture, like you should pick the tool that suits you and that you are productive with. So we have no uh, strong feeling. Although for Android development, um, Visual Studio, like not Visual Studio, Android Studio tends to be helping you like it automates a lot of tasks for you so I yeah I kind of use it I, I use IntelliJ with the Vim extension so I have Vim shortcuts there um, you can do mobile programming using command line tools and automate things kind of um, in bash but yeah I don't know it's much easier to start with Android Studio um, yeah we have that we have that. So which domains are interesting for you? So a little bit of augmented virtual reality. A majority of people are kind of games, multiplayer, data analytics, and productivity apps. Um, sensors is also quite, quite popular, almost over 40%. I, we are thinking of kind of giving you more choice of what you will be developing instead of us designing some of the topics and some of the apps are for you. So yeah, it's a good mix. In the past, we've been using that to design what the exercises were, but I will talk about it next week. Um, yeah, majority of people are Android that we knew after the first one. Some people, like most people have experience with JSON and XML, version control. Um, 
It was interesting. We had a kind of a seminar last week with people from NTNU Trondheim, and the lecturers there from second year were saying that uh, they would like, they would love students to use Git for a lot of things, but not all of them know Git in the second year. So we were we kind of felt good because in Jovic everybody is expected to know Git really well by the second year. We kind of introduce it, you know, straight from the semester one. Uh, it's a skill that. Is not that hard to acquire, but it's very useful. Um, yep, you haven't done mobile development <coughs> before. Um, you're not con confident in your skills. So we would like this chart to look like this chart after the course, right? Like this one. So that's nice. Um, Yes, so most of you built some web-based apps using REST API. Most of you also took cloud, so that fits here. Um, you haven't done mobile development, so this is low. Um, native app development, there are some people who have um, experience with that, and some people who did kind of a games using some libraries. Um, so yeah, th 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 this kind of fits the same as this one. Um, and Yes, most of you did the cloud course with us, and some of you did the application development uh, course. Why those are relevant? Because that this course sort of runs in similar fashion. You will be expected to do some projects and to develop some apps. Uh, so it's good that most of you kind of had experience with that before. Um, any questions or comments on the on the data? Are you surprised with the results? I'm not really surprised. I kind of thought it confirms what we were expecting. Um, I think the um, Elizabeth was uh, asking about how motivated you are, so she will be pleased to see that you, you kind of are quite motivated. All right, no questions? All right, so let's um, let's progress to the next item on the agenda, which was the very brief introduction to Java uh, and uh, some of the programming conventions. Um, I did cover that in the lecture in the videos in more detail, especially the talk about the Java, uh, but I was using kind of the uh, whiteboard and it wasn't as clear, so I will repeat a little bit. Um, so Java was invented for uh, isolating us from the underlying platform. So Back in a day, you had to cross-compile something to run on uh, Sun, Sun OS, uh, Windows, Linux, Unix, uh, Apple, and so on and so forth. And because the web was taking over, uh, Sun Microsystems, they thought it would be nice to have a common language which you can use to program in the browser. At that time, we only had HTML and CSS. Um, JavaScript kind of existed, but it... Um, I don't think it existed to that extent that we have it now. I, I'm not even sure which was first, Java or JavaScript. I didn't check. Uh, yeah, so, so Java was probably the first one to address the programming in the web. And it was developed by Sun to be the a web browser kind of a programming language. That you will write a small program that will be independent of the underlying platform. Therefore, you can run it on Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever browser you have and it will be downloaded to your browser and the browser will, will run it. Those small programs were called applets and that's how Java started. Um, it turned out JavaScript was developed and JavaScript kind of took over for web programming. Uh, it was more lightweight and it was good enough. Uh, and then Java kind of, in, you know, funnily enough, instead of uh, making its home in the browsers, it kind of migrated to the server side. So Java is now mostly used on the server side as a server side programming language, not as a front end browser programming language, right? Um, and then um, as, um, so, so when you're designing a language which is kind of independent of the platform, you have to make some choices. So one of the choice they've made is that uh, because Java runs in the virtual machine, it makes sense that the memory management is managed by the runtime system, not by the programmer. So Java has a garbage collector, and the garbage collector manages the memory. So in Java, you do have a new construct. So when you're allocating a new object on the, on the heap, you say new something, and then a memory is allocated on the heap. 
but then you never really release it yourself manually, like in C++. It just happens naturally. So you kind of allocate memory all over the place, and then you don't care. There is no memory leaks, and you know, so to speak, and there is no kind of a worry about memory management because it is taken care by the um, by the runtime system, right? So you you cre to create a new object, you say new something, and then you have a like in in a C++, but then you never say delete or never say kind of um, you, you never clean the memory yourself. Um, you have the same concepts as in um, C or C++ that you have stack allocation. So when you say, if you have a method body and you allocate some variables in this method body, uh, you say, I have a string or if I have an array, this is kind of allocated on the stack. And once the method body finishes with the closing bracket, this memory is uh, freed. And you have um, um, memory allocated on the heap, right? So in in Go or in um, so if I have um, if I have some method, so I have method M, opening bracket, closing bracket, and here I said I have uh, an int array, right? So I have a variable um, A, which is an array of ints, and I said it's like ten. <coughs> Right? So I have 10 ints allocated to A. The moment I quit the body, so when the method starts, it allocates it on the stack. When the method finishes, it's kind of quit on the stack, right? So that's the kind of a stack allocation. And then if I have D, which I say is new, um, I don't know, new person, um, then this new keyword allocates in D on the heap. And then depending if D is being passed somewhere else, it's being cleaned up somewhere else, or if D scope finishes here, if I don't pass it like, if I don't put uh, the reference somewhere else, then this, at this point, garbage collector knows D is never used anymore, therefore I can clean it up, right? So the runtime system kind of tracks the memory and kind of organizes it like this. Um, remember in, in Go, um, when I um, allocated a new, so in, let's say this is go down, and I said I have a new person with uh, braces, right? So I kind of created a new struct, which is a person, and it's assigned to B. And then it's the same story with Go. If I close here and B was not passed anywhere, then B will be free. But B is allocated on the heap, right? And then if I have a return, if I say uh, my method returns, like in Go I write here, but in Java I write here, so if my method returns person, and B, if I say return B, and we back to Java, so we say new. Um, now I allocated something inside the method, but I kind of pass it somewhere else. Of course, garbage collector will not clean it here. It will clean it when B is not used anymore, somewhere else, right? If some method, if another method called M and allocated B here, and there is another method, then if B is not used beyond this scope, at this closing bracket, B will be free, right? In, um, in Go or in Java, this cleaning up doesn't happen at that point. So basically, the memory is marked as, as unused, but the garbage collector has its own thread, and it kind of schedules the cleaning up at certain intervals. And that's why game programmers don't like garbage collected languages, because you never know when the garbage collector will kick in. And sometimes you are doing something at like real-time processing that you really need those computing cycles to be allocated for your physics calculations or for your rendering, but then the garbage collector kicks in and takes your resources and you have a kind of a jitter, right? You have a, you have a lag. Um, in memory managed languages like Go or Java, you like don't care about memory management, but then again, you don't know when the garbage collector will clean things up. And um, manually managed languages, memory managed languages like Rust or C++, you're in full control when do you call delete, right? So then you know when the memory allocations and deallocations happen. Calling new and delete is expensive. It, it takes time because it has to go to the OS and kind of call some operating system uh, functions to clean or allocate memory. Um, so 
Um, yeah, the, the bottom line is you don't care about memory management in Java, but you do have heap, heap and stack variables, and you have references, right? So when I uh, declare a person, so I have a variable B which is of type person, actually it's a reference to a person, it's a reference to an object, right? Uh, we don't have pass by value in Java uh, in terms of objects, we only have pass by reference. So if I'm returning person, I'm actually returning a reference to a person. If I'm passing another person to you, so if I say um, there is a person A, which I'm passing as an input variable here, it's a reference to a person, right? I can kind of do, I can say um, B is a new person, and then B dot main is the same as in dot main. Right, but this in is not a value, I, I pass a, a, a reference. So if I change it, if I say in here and b here, I will actually change the name of the person who was passed in, right? And in Java, you, you cannot prevent this. So in Java, you cannot prevent somebody messing up what is inside your, um, um, your object. So Java has a, um, a statement in final, which is similar to C++, and I can declare my uh, my variable final, which means I cannot change this, but I can still really uh, call um, changing the attribute of that of that variable. I cannot say n equals b if I if I said that this is final. I cannot do this. The compiler will complain about this statement, but it will never complain about reassignment of the field, right? Um, I, I will kind of stop here because that requires those of you who never had Java to actually understand a little bit more about Java. Those who had Java, it, it, as I'm saying, it's just kind of a refresher. Um, so what, what I will do is I will kind of talk a little bit about the, the kind of a conventions. So in Go, uh, the conventions were set by the linter and by the compiler. So for example, the braces and so on were kind of enforced by the tooling. In Java, we sort of follow the uh, we follow the conventions, so let me just see where I have it. Introduction here, Java. No, I have to open it. All right, so there is one small mistake. I have this uh, checked it, so the, the repo is not on Pro 3, it was on Pro 3 last year. Um, and then um, we um, the first question is, why do we have coding conventions? It's a refresher, we, we discussed that before, but why Go enforces the bracket placement or why do we have coding conventions in general? Why we have linters which enforce some, some rules? Yeah? Exactly. So it, it is to help re in the readability of the code and maintainability of the code. So we have the common code base, which kind of feels e um, consistent and as expected if we were coding it ourselves. Uh, so the conventions are to facilitate um, a group work, more easily exchange of code, contributing to a code base and kind of taking ownership of the code base. So even Imagine that you are the only person working on that code. And would you, as a single developer, you have no other team members, would you follow a conventions as well? Why? Exactly, and? <laughs> exactly, right? You're kind of doing it for yourself as well, right? For your future self, right? So if you're kind of consistent and if you keep yourself to certain rules, if you come back to your own project after some time, you understand it and you know what is happening. If you kind of are coding in a spaghetti way or in a different uh, coding conventions all over the place, you come back to your project after a while and it's like, what the hell? Like, what is going on? Why uh, I'm doing things this way? Uh, and you forget, you may have reasons, to do certain things certain way 
back on in, in, on the spot. Often the reason is yeah, yeah, I just do something quickly and fix it like you know later, and you never fix it, and then like you know you come back to it and it's like okay, it's broken, like I I did it wrong. Um, so even if you're doing it for yourself, you should stick to the rules. Um, so what um, we usually have in the course is uh, we had some kind of a non-negotiable rules, um, which are kind of generic. Um, and we had some rules which were up to the team, were up to the group. They are more flexible, right? Um, so the non-negotiable uh, rules um, that readability is um, the, the key aspect. Um, of course, you can do something really terribly inefficiently uh, and claim that you've done it because of readability. But it's very rare that you will actually be able to do that, right? If something is extremely inefficient, it's usually not that nice to maintain either. Um, so, yeah, the point is, if you're writing code as a communication to somebody else. You're not writing the code to make it fast or to to make it optimized. You're primarily writing it to for readability and maintainability. Um, so if you are planning to optimize it, it's a separate programming step. It's not the programming which does the optimization, it's the optimization and performance team which does the optimization, right? So as a programmer, usually you don't care so much about performance, uh, with some exceptions, of course. There, there are some rules that we follow which are kind of natural, uh, which don't make the code terribly inefficient. Uh, but generally, until you can prove to me that something is inefficient and something needs to be optimized, I don't buy the argument that you wrote something particular way because it will be faster. You need to have evidence that it is actually faster. So it means you need to write it twice. You need to write it in the inefficient way and then show me that the more efficient way is actually faster. Uh, and often you'll be surprised. Uh, often what you think will make code faster actually doesn't make it faster. Uh, so don't think about it when you're programming, just focus on um, programming as a communicating, as expressing what needs to, needs to happen um, and make it easy to maintain. Um, so in Java and in other programming languages, we kind of don't type, don't say what's obvious. And in Java, there are kind of uh, three things that are, or, or four things that are by default. So for example, um, all the numbers are initialized to zero. So if you're saying int b equals zero, don't do that. Say int b, same in Go, right? Uh, everything will have the default value, which is kind of known, and you don't have to say it. The second one is for null references. If you say person b, that you're declaring a person, it will be null by default. In Kotlin, it's different. That those rules are kind of for Java. Uh, we don't write empty constructors. Uh, because empty default constructor is generated by default as well. And if you're writing interface, all the methods in the interface are public. So you don't have to say they are public because they have to be public. So you skip the keyword public. So basically, you try to be succinct. So things that are already known and that are already part by default, don't say it. Don't, don't say it in the code. Um, so th those are simple. Uh, those are kind of some practical ones. Um, yeah, this is not terribly wrong, but it's kind of a frown upon, right? What we want is we want to know that there are two variables and both are um, of certain type and they have some um, uh, meaningful names, right? So this is kind of okay-ish, but this is much better, right? Because we know what W and H are and it kind of gives the, when you're reading the rest of the context, you will kind of understand the code better. You don't need to keep the mental kind of account of what this is. This is also um, wrong because you're declaring two different variables with two different types in a single line. That's a little bit too much to kind of uh, absorb. It's, it's easier if you're declaring one thing at the time, line by line, than doing too many things in the single line. Of course you can do that, and if it, if there is a reason to do that, you, you can do that, it will compile, it will be fine, but it's less readable than doing kind of a more explicit declarations like this, right? Um, 
how we use constants in Java, we, we will discuss a little bit later. So if you have to have a counter like I, you don't need a fancy name for a counter, I is fine, but usually it's better if you kind of embed it in the context. So the scope of I here is the for loop, um, and I don't need to remember that there is I somewhere outside of this for loop if I'm only using it in the for loop, right? Those rules are perfectly fine for C++ as well. Like uh, those rules are not necessarily Java specific. Uh, so for indexing, we usually use I, J, K, L, same as everywhere else. Um, but again, when you're doing loops, you should use range loops, same as we did in Go. So Java has like a range loops, Kotlin has range loops. And what, what it means is that you will kind of iterate over a collection and the loop will give you each element of the collection to process. And that's safer, right? Uh, with those, there is more typing and there is more possibility of errors if you're basically iterating over something. Uh, so you should use range loops everywhere unless you really need to use a classical uh, for loop. It was kind of the same in Go. Most of our loops were range loops, but sometimes you basically need to have a normal loop, uh, like for loop, then you use it. Uh, but you try to use range loops uh, instead. Um, so braces uh, follow same as in Go. Um, so they kind of don't follow the C++ conventions where the brace kind of follows this line. Uh, the braces is basically like in Go, but it's not enforced by the compiler. It's basically just a convention. Um, and then the for loop with the range looks like this, right? So we kind of have a collection of deleted points and we have P which iterates over the deleted points. So in Go, it was like assignment here and says range of something. Here, we, you just say colon uh, and then you uh, iterate over a collection. Uh, if you have an if statement, <coughs> if you have if else statement and you can rewrite such that you don't need else because, for example, one of them has return or one of them throws an exception, that means you don't really need both, you just need one, uh, then you should remove the else statement and re redo it the way that there is no else statement. Uh, so for example, if you have code like this, uh, you should try to have code like this. Um, this is less readable than this, and this is less maintainable than this, right? Um, why? So which one is more readable and easier to maintain? This one or this one? Yeah. Exactly. In the range we expect exactly so here we kind of uh, deal with exceptional situation up front and we know if we don't have exceptional situation everything is like normal right uh, here we say okay uh, there is some exceptional situation handled somehow we we do okay if it isn't it's normal but then if it is it's this and this like we have to carry this context when we're reading from top to bottom through all this thing right and that is mental load, so, so this is better. Um, all right, so then there is a lot of, um, like Java is a, and Kotlin are object-oriented, um, so we use a lot of design patterns. So for example, if we uh, say um, um, iterator, or if we say a visitor pattern, or if we say a decorator, you should kind of understand what those patterns are, so I encourage you to check kind of a design patterns. Um, there is a listener and observer, observable observer patterns used inside the JVM uh, quite heavily. So there are some object-oriented patterns that are kind of uh, typical and we use them. Um, there are some anti-patterns which we should not use. Uh, and also Kotlin is a little bit more multi-paradigm. So Java is kind of a very object-oriented and it feels um, 
kind of like C++, but with object orientation being a little bit more mature, more uh, enhanced, um, because you have reflection, you have uh, more kind of object oriented features of the language. Uh, but Kotlin also is functional. You can use kind of a functional construct, you can use folds, you can use um, higher order functions much more easily. Uh, so um, those design patterns which are listed here are only for Java, for kind of object oriented languages. Uh, for Kotlin, I encourage you to kind of uh, look for some of the functional patterns as well. And of course, we kind of like dependency injection. So there is an article about dependency injection in Java. It kind of applies to Kotlin as well. Um, so there is a discussion point, what's wrong, sorry, what's wrong with the singleton? Why we should not use singletons? And when should we use singleton? What is singleton? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, imagine that I have an application, um, some complex application, and I only need one instance, one object of certain class. Right? Uh, why do I need to make it into a singleton? Why cannot, can I just have a, like a main function saying, okay, I create this one object and then using dependency injection, pass it on and use it. Instead, I create a singleton class and have a single instance of that single, of, of that class. What would be the reason to do the singleton? It is kind of, um, yes, so it is kind of like a global variable which enforces that it's only one no matter what, right? So it means that nobody else can create a second instance of that class and then if an, anyone needs an instance of that class, everyone is forced to use that single one, right? So it's kind of like a, a guarding mechanism for anybody else doing anything outside of that pattern, right? So if I have my application and I need to access that instance, I am guaranteeing that it will be that one single instance, right? That's what the single pattern enforces, right? <coughs> and in itself, it's kind of okay. It, it's fine that it enforces it, but the way it works is it basically like having a global variable which everybody references, right? Uh, and therefore, it complicates some of the system testing or some of the mocking because you're hardwiring the dependencies to that single global variable, right? And that's why a singleton is often considered an anti-pattern because it prevents kind of a nice modular testing. Uh, so instead, what you should do, you should do dependency injection and kind of inject that single instance and prevent anybody else having ability to create a second instance by protecting the constructor or by doing something else, but by, but by not having the um, um, singleton kind of enforced, right? So there are different mechanisms to, to, to support what we need to achieve and at the same time allow kind of a more flexible testing. All right, so then how we deal with constants? Um, in th this is about Java, but it's, it's sort of uh, similar in, in Kotlin. So we have, um, basically we kind of do cups uh, by convention and we can um, have a global variable, which is public, static, final, which means it's not going to change. And it's visible everywhere, uh, and it's visible from like single to pattern. It's a static static thing, right? Um, and uh, we initialize it. Um, so there are two um, general conventions in Java. Uh, you can keep them inside the interface because we usually have more than one constant, right? If you have a class there where you need one single constant, you just put it there. But if you have your application and your application uses like five different constants, where do you keep them? Um, well, you can keep them in the interface or you can keep them in the <coughs> class. Uh, and there are kind of pros and cons for both. Um, most people these days will kind of opt for having a single class which is static and then which has static uh, properties and then you say this class name 
dot and then the, the constant that, that you use. Um, historically, more people were using in the interface because your class can inherit from the interface and then in your code, you just use the constant names. You don't have to prefix them by the class if you inherit from the interface. Uh, but it, it's up to you to decide. Like I, I tend to agree more with the second option, with having a constants, constants in the static class, but um, you can kind of make the, the case. Yeah, those are all modifiers. I will not go over this. Um, I will not all go over that neither. All right, so the rest is kind of in the videos. Uh, and the videos go more into Java, like from the beginning. It's a little bit, um, uh, I kind of only rush through the conventions, yeah? So that, that wasn't entirely true what, what I said. So all object-oriented variables are references, and you need to say new in front of every ones that you instantiate. But Java also have primitive types, and the primitive types are int, float, boolean, and those are with small letter. All the object-oriented types are capital capitalized, so all the types which start with the capital letter, you know that they are object-oriented. But the primitive types like int, it's with small i, boolean with small b, and floats and double with small letters. Those you don't uh, specify with new. You, you just have them, and when you pass them into methods, you pass them by value, right? So um, in, in Java, uh, if you have, um, let's say we have, so um, let's say we have an integer, which is h, and we are kind of inside some body, like some main, uh, main function, right? So we have h, and let's say h is 21, and then I have a method, um, um, yeah, so let's say I have a method h, which, and here I have h of uh, Margaret, and then I want to take her, and uh, the method h basically adds one to the h, right? So I want to pass uh, h here, so the method will kind of uh, increase the number by one, right? So if I have a, a function now um, which returns nothing, which is called h, and it takes a parameter, uh, and then the, the goal is to increase it by one, right? If I do this, if I pass h and here, and if I say it takes an integer, and the integer is um, i, and I say i plus plus, right? Um, what will happen is this h will be passed by value, uh, and then I will only get uh, uh, 22 here, and 22 will disappear at, at that spot because this variable is allocated on the start. I increase the value by 1, 22 is here, but it disappears, and I come back here, and h m here is 21, right? Correct? So, and it would work the same in C or C++, right? So, same as in C or C++, what I need to do is I need to pass a reference to the primitive type, right? <coughs> so, I have to say, this is a, a reference or pointer to i, and here I have to say I'm passing the, the reference, right? So, it's the same as in Go, and it's the same in, as in C++. But, if I say I have an integer, HM, and that is an uh, object oriented type, and I pass, pass HM here, and this one, instead of taking int, takes the integer like this. I don't need the reference because I cannot pass by value. I have to, that, that is always by reference, right? So primitive types can be passed by reference or by value, but object oriented types with the uh, object type can only passed by, um, by reference. Does it answer your question? Yeah? Yeah. You can. So, no, so normally you can, right? 
So if I have this graph here, um, I said I have integer with capital I, integer HM, and if I have another integer um, HD, which is 22, then I can say HD equals HM. I can do that. And I can also say HM equals HD. I can do that. Right? That's fine. But if I said this one is final, then I can do this one. But this one, the compiler will complain. It says, hey, look, you said uh, HD can only be assigned once. And you're reassigning what HD is. It, it was already 22, and now you're changing it. You cannot change it, right? You cannot change the assignment. So for, for if I mark this one final, then I cannot do this assignment. If I mark both of them final, then I cannot do any of those assignments. If you will have questions about like uh, final static or classes or inner classes or interfaces, uh, bring them on next week. So those of you who never had Java before, those are kind of a usual contention points where people need a little bit more explanations to, to kind of um, understand it. So if you don't quite understand something, then I'll bring it, bring it next week and we will kind of discuss it. Those of you who had Java, uh, I guess that, that was a kind of a refresher. Questions? All right, so let's have a break till quarter past. And then quarter past, we will talk about Android.
All right. Um, so let's uh, let us continue. Um, so we sort of really zoom through the conventions. Uh, they are not as important as last year because last year we did everything in Java. This year we'll be doing more in Kotlin. So some of the Java conventions are not that uh, relevant anymore. Uh, but at least we sort of um, touched it. So in the videos, I am also last year going through this uh, slides and I'm talking about Android and the, uh, the Android development and so on. What I want to focus on to kind of repeat again uh, is just the basic programming on Android. Okay. So the history and the development, like how it grew, like how the consortium got together, that those are kind of uh, nice to know, but you can get it from the video. Um, I want to kind of uh, wave my hands a little bit more and kind of uh, talk a little bit about mobile programming, right? Uh, so I will skip uh, most of those slides. Um, I will not skip that one. So Android is an open source platform. So for a lot of people, Android is just the operating system. Uh, but actually it's not. It's the entire platform that um, kind of um, allowed an ecosystem to exist. Uh, so the philosophy behind Android is really different um, to the philosophy, for example, of iOS. Um, so you have to... Um, so in the historical context, Google is not the telecommunication company. Google is an advertising company, right? Google doesn't produce hardware and Google doesn't carry, doesn't have any telco capabilities in itself, right? It's basically an advertisement company. So historically, back in a day, the telecommunications companies were uh, monopolizing the access to mobile networks, so to speak. And Google was, uh, and, and they kind of kept the mobile handsets the way they were, right? Um, the, I mentioned it um, in the first lecture, I mentioned this, uh, this project, uh, Neo um, 1973. Uh, so this is one of the very first, um, very first, uh, yeah, I have the uh, larger version here, of very first smartphones which came up on the market and it was open source and open hardware. And it was kind of the, the voice of the community to uh, break the monopoly of the telecommunication companies. So for example, in the old days, you couldn't easily switch the SIM card from one phone to the other. When you bought a contract for a telco provider, you were tied to that provider. Uh, in some hand handsets, you couldn't even take the SIM card out. It was kind of uh, welded into the phone itself. So you were buying the phone with the contract to have phone calls, right? Um, and they regulated which phones were on the market or not. So you couldn't, for example, have an iPhone in Norway unless Telia or Telenor this, you know, allowed it to be in Norway, right? Um, and that changed because of, of those uh, players. So OpenMoco was one and they failed. They, they, they basically had to fall down. Uh, they, they went bankrupt, um, <laughs> mostly because it was a prototype and it was a not working phone, uh, but for other reasons as well. And then kind of a Google kind of took over and tried to break that monopoly as well. And initially it was kind of hard because um, Google kind of couldn't do it on, on its own. So they got all the manufacturers and all the telco companies kind of on board within the project. And they created so-called open hand, handheld alliance and they created the specification for this open standard. And then they, they bought the original uh, small a uh, virtual machine prototype developed by uh, a guy in Iceland uh, um, and from the village Dalvik and that what became the kind of known as Android. Um, so Android is kind of a, like to cut the, sto the, the long story short, it, it is a kind of a platform which allows an ecosystem to exist and it's a, a, it's a very large ecosystem. So all those um, Chinese brands or all those uh, other brands which have Android phones, they kind of uh, pay small royalties to this alliance. Uh, and of course, Google kind of benefits from it. But at the same time, you have like Samsung, you have like Huawei and so on, which have their own um, kind of a look and feel and they own kind of proprietary crap 
on their platforms and Google doesn't kind of tell them, no, you cannot do that, right? So there are certain rules that they have to follow. For example, they should not break Gmail or they should not break some other things. Um, but um, they kind of are free to, to do what they want on, the, on, on their platforms. Um, and that moved, that move was quite successful because I just checked before the lecture um, the, um, the market share of Android versus iOS. And funny enough, like uh, no other platform is even remotely significant, right? There, there is no other platform um, in the last few years. Um, what was here like uh, before? What, what do you remember? Yeah. Windows Phone, Blackberry, what else? Yeah. Ubuntu, yeah. Symbian, yes, Symbian was quite big actually. It was the old Nokia kind of uh, line of phones. Uh, so at the time I started teaching mobile, like we actually used Symbian, like an Android was not there yet. Uh, it was just kind of a starting and we were teaching Symbian, but you know, fast forward, the, all everything else went to zero, right? Um, and Android is uh, 87 percent market share and iOS is 19, uh, 13, right? So it means this kind of a more open um, methodology, the more open source, more openness, kind of allowing different people to kind of a play on the level playing field kind of works. Um, it doesn't mean it, it's not like Apple is a very successful company and they're doing really well, uh, but on kind of the kind of a global scale, like basically Android kind of took over. Those numbers are how many handheld devices were sold, right? So that doesn't count all the Android car entertainment systems and, and Android TVs and all those things, right? This is just for the handheld um, mobile phones effectively uh, because Android is even bigger if you count all those other things in as well. Um, right, so more, uh, so let's stop bragging about that, so it's a platform. So that, that was the important one. And then, um, yes, I go through like the stack, like what does it have in the video lecture, so I will not repeat myself. I will kind of um, talk very quickly about this, uh, although it is covered in the, in the videos as well. So the source code, which in our case will be Kotlin, um, so, in, in, in general, um, you have JVM, right? So you have a Java virtual machine. Um, and if you're running it, if you're running your applications, like if you wrote something in Java and it runs on the server side, uh, what happens is you have um, kind of a two technologies. You have um, you have just in time, uh, you have just in time compiler or ahead of time compiler. And the compiler basically takes the bytecode. So here, what you have is bytecode, um, which is like a binary representation of a universal um, uh, virtual machine uh, program. And it takes this bytecode and compiles it into a native uh, executable, right? So on Windows, it will be kind of those exe type of file. Uh, on um, uh, on Intel or um, I don't know ARM CPUs, it will be particular machine code which runs on the CPU, right? Uh, and then in here you have a source code, right? So here I have my source code, um, and the source code is dot Java. So I write a Java file which is like text. A readable text the programmer writes. This Java program is compiled, is compiled into a bytecode, which is not human readable, binary representation of this of this text. And this bytecode then is subsequently compiled into a native code. Right? Does it make sense? You can have other languages which are compiled into the bytecode. So on the JVM, the most popular one is. Java, obviously, so you, you have Java. What other languages do you know 
which are very popular, which are also compiled into Java bytecode. Well, what language will we learn this course? Okay, so Kotlin, right? <laughs> Come on. Uh, maybe it's not super popular, but it's another one. And there is one more which you, I'm sure you've heard of, which fits this, this category. No, JavaScript is not. But you can have JavaScript compiled into bytecode and run on JVM. But it's not the one I'm thinking here. But JavaScript is another one. Um, but less popular. It, it's less popular to do that, right? Uh, you can use uh, Elm, which is sort of like, um, no, Elm is not. Elm is like into JavaScript. Um, so what's this one? Scala. Have you heard of Scala? Yeah. So it's one of those kind of a hybrid uh, functional object-oriented programming languages, which is quite popular, and it's also compiled into the JVM, right? So this is the typical stack that you kind of do. You have some language uh, that is um, that the programmers kind of use, the mental model that you use. Then this is compiled into a bytecode, and there is a mental uh, language. The bytecode has two representations. It has a kind of the assembly re representation and kind of a binary representation, right? Uh, the assembly is human readable. The binary is just, uh, you know, uh, numbers. Uh, this one only has two. It has set representation. Uh, and then the native code, again, it has two, right? You have the assembly for x86 and the actual binary, right? Um, <coughs> this is very similar to dot .NET, right? Dot .NET structure. You heard of this? This one? Yeah, yeah so, so you have a, a one compiler which takes this source code, this text, and generates the binary representation for the JVM. Okay. And then this binary representation, there is another compiler which is built in into the, the JVM, which takes this binary representation and produces a native executable for the particular platform. This is platform independent. It's kind of runs on JVM, on this virtual machine. This runs on the physical machine, um, on x86, <coughs> or ARM, or you know Motorola in the old days. Um, we don't have many different CPUs anymore, uh, but it's like Sun also has some parts, ultra parts, right? Um, so those are kind of a uh, particular architecture um, which the native compiler compiles into. This one is kind of universal. So this, the JVM is kind of equivalent to .NET, VM, right? What .NET languages do you know that run on top of .NET? C sharp, what else? F sharp, what else? Yeah, I don't know that many new stuffs. <laughs> it was Java. So uh, Microsoft at some point had Java compiled to .NET. And what Microsoft did, they introduced some language features where making it impossible for this type of Java to run on the Sun JVM were only working on .NET platform. And Sun said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Come on, this is Java, right? Java should run it on a universal VM and you cannot introduce features that kind of tied it to that to your VM, right? Because .NET is Microsoft platform. And Microsoft lost the lawsuit. They had to pay fines and they had to remove those features from the language. And when they had to do that, they killed it, right? So they said, okay, screw it, then we will not have JavaScript, right? Um, so that's kind of funny story. Uh, what else do you have here? You have potentially other languages, right? You can even have C++ compiling to .NET. Right? Um, and then .NET also has a bytecode, so it's the same story as here. It will have some kind of a, um, a representation for the universal binary, and then it will have a compiler, so just in time compiler or ahead of time uh, compiler, uh, which will compile this binary into a machine code. Um, the thing is that .NET is kind of specific to x86 plus Windows, right? Um, 
they try to make that net a little bit more universal so it can run on uh, Linux as well. And to some extent it does. So you have a mono framework which is a .NET port of .NET platform to run on Linux. Uh, but it doesn't have all the features that this one has, that the, the normal .NET platform has. Uh, in terms of design, the .NET is a little bit more uh, mature and a little bit better design than JVM. So JVM is a, is a stack based um, machine which um, has a little bit of trouble dealing with tailored uh, recursive languages which have, like if you have a function which calls itself, then you have to have a recursive call, right? So some VMs like this one can optimize the tailored recursive calls nicely to help uh, using kind of like a functional languages to be more efficient on the actual, like when you're comparing it to the native accessibility, you have some machinery to do that well. Uh, with JVM, you don't have that. So in terms of VM, uh, this one is actually better. Even though I'm not really a fan of monopolistic practices and so on, like on the engineering side, the .NET is a little bit better designed than JVM. But JVM is, of course, much more widely used and it has more impact, mostly because of Android adopted it. Um, Anyway, that was a bit of a detour. So the, 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 this, this slide kind of shows what happens with the, with the Java file, which you want to deploy on the um, Android platform. And I wanted to kind of uh, explain some of the acronyms. So the two acronyms which I said there, just in time and ahead of time. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that when you're loading a program, let's say you have a program that big, you loaded it and you start running it. But you cannot run it here because you need the machine code, right? So the machine code and your program consists of functions and it has a main function, the main function calls other functions and so on, right? So it loads, it compiles the main function and then it starts running it. So now, let's say it, it calls a function which you haven't compiled yet, right? So when you load the app and you start running it, you, you have like a delay because now it's your, the program you're running is calling a function which you haven't compiled yet, right? So then it compiles it, loads it, and then you, you run it. And again, you will hit a point which hasn't been compiled yet, and it will compile it, and it will run it, right? So that's what JIT is. JIT is basically it compiles only the bits which are about to be run and doesn't compile anything else which is not kind of running, right? So if you have if statement, and if statement branches to true and false, and your program says true, it will compile that, and that part will never get compiled because you never run it, right? So the benefit of JIT is that it's, uh, it loads very quick. Your application starts running quick, but the disadvantage is that you may have those kind of like with garbage collector, you may have those unexpected delays sometimes because you hit the point which hasn't been compiled yet. It has to go there, compile it, load it, and then continue running, right? So to prevent this to happen, when you need kind of a steady performance, like for example, you have a, you loaded a game and then you're playing some real-time strategy and then at some point you have like, ah, it's like stopped, right? It is like compiling shit, right? So you can't have that. So for those situations, we have ahead of time. And what it happens, what it means is it loads the, the bytecode or it, what it needs and compiles everything, right? Up front. So what it means is you're loading your game and then you're waiting, right? for everything to compile, and then it starts running. But once it starts running, it never needs to compile anything again. So then it runs kind of a more predictably, right? So the JIT or ahead of time are two mechanisms to compile from bytecode to the executable, either kind of just in time or ahead of time as the name suggests, right? You should, you should be fine with that now. So um, we take the source code, we compile it into the class file. So we do the first part, we compile the text into the bytecode, and then the bytecode is compiled again into another bytecode. Why, why Android is doing that? Well, it turned out that when the designers of, Android, of uh, JVM were doing it, um, the space wasn't such a big issue as it is on the mobile devices, uh, and they could, um, yeah, to cut the, the story uh, short, like you can optimize some ways of dealing with constants and with method calls and objects in a better way that JVM is doing it, right? And you can save space 
and you can sp uh, save some redundancy, which is normally in the in the Java bytecode. So the the people who are doing um, Android, they said we will use the Java JVM, but actually they said, well, actually we can't really do that because it's inefficient. So we will use uh, a modified JVM, which is compatible on the language side, but does certain things differently. And they have a different format. So normally your Java class or your Kotlin class gets compiled to dot class. Uh, but in Android, those classes which compose, which, cons um, which are part of your program get packaged up into something which is called dot dex. And this dot, dot dex file is like the new version of the bytecode which runs on the Dalvik virtual machine. So Android doesn't use JVM, it uses its own implementation of the virtual machine, which is different from JVM. And funny story again, there was a lawsuit between Oracle, which currently owns Java, and, and Google, because um, Oracle wanted Google to pay royalties for some of the APIs which the um, Android is using, right? So I don't know whether you've heard about it, but there was a big lawsuit like a few years back where the concept of the API was at stake. Like the, the court had to decide if you can have a copyright of on the API, right? So if you are a programmer and you're writing a method, uh, and it turns out that your method is called uh, void string, right? And it takes a string as an argument. This could be copyrighted, right? And you might need to pay royalties to somebody who came up with this signature, right, of the method, right? And all programmers are saying, well, that makes no sense. Like, you cannot copyright method signatures. You can copyright our work, right? You can copyright the method like the algorithm or the uh, the functions which are here, like how it is, how it happens, but you cannot copyright the signature of the method. Whereas Oracle was saying, no, no, we should be able to do that, right? And eventually the court said, no, you cannot do that. You cannot copyright the signature, right? So because this new bytecode machine is called Dalvik, and it uses the same method signatures as Java, Oracle wanted Google to pay Java royalties. Right? But they said, no, we've re-implemented everything. It's not what you have, it's completely new. We're just using the same method signatures, right? Um, so that was kind of an important lawsuit as well. Uh, and it ma uh, maintained the method signatures are not copyrightable uh, for the, the time being. So anyway, it kind of packages up into DEX, DEX file and then it packages the DEX file, which is your program plus all the assets into what's called APK. Uh, so it's kind of like application package um, which is deployed on the on the phone. So when you need to install it manually, you need to download this kind of the APK. So it's a single zip container which has everything in it, right? So what happens is when you're uh, installing it, it basically unpacks it. It separates the DEX file, which is kind of a nicely laid out memory allocations for all the function and all the classes and it keeps it kind of uh, well aligned in the phone memory so it can actually be used to run stuff directly and then unpacks all the resources and native code to make kind of a dynamic links between your executable and this and it kind of uh, cross compiles it onto the platform right so you may have some part which um, on like if, if you install it on the uh, on your arm particular arm cpu then you may have already pre-compiled something on the on the platform, or you have everything kind of in the platform independent way, and then just in time compiler will kind of compile from Dalvi to the native code, right? And um, it does it for this uh, Dex part, and then it does it for this kind of a native part, and then at the end of the day, you have this kind of Linux exec executable because Android basically runs Linux which is in the ELF format. It's a binary uh, representation of executables on, uh, on Linux. And we have two um, virtual machines. So we have Dalvik and Art. Art is the new one, and we basically all the new fonts only have Art now. So we've migrated from Dalvik to this one. It, it's almost identical. They have kind of improved certain things, and the ahead of time compiler has been substantially kind of improved here. Um, so. Art and Dalvik are 
two virtual machine compilers or kind of a runtime systems, which are used for running executable on, on Android. Uh, we run native code. Uh, and just-in-time compiler converts from Dalvik to native or from ARC to native. And then this DEX file is basically a converted class files into the uh, new Dalvik uh, format for the virtual machine. Yeah, does it make sense? I hope it makes sense. Yeah, so if you remember from this slide, if you remember what JIT and ahead of time is, if you remember what bytecode is, and what languages are for uh, JVM, that's all you need to remember. Yeah. All right, so I will skip all those. I will skip those. Uh, and we do um, a little bit of a discussion of what, how it, like, what do you have to program the Android platform or mobile platform? So um, it is a little bit different to programming normal devices because you're restricted in the screen size and in the memory. Memory and storage are not such a big deal, like uh, my phone has uh, 256 gig of storage and it has a decent amount of RAM, so it's almost like a laptop, right? Like if, if I go five years ago, my laptop was worse than my phone now, right? Uh, but the screen is basically the same shit, right? So if I go to a typical, um, like if I um, Google, um, let's do, Like, let's, let's pick a random, um, yeah, whatever, Let, like this, for example, right? So I have a window here. Um, so I have a window with a menu bar with a lot of stuff. Would you be able to use it on your mobile phone? No, because it's like too tiny to pick things, right? At the beginning when the uh, smartphones were coming up, we only had Linux and we are basically were doing uh, <laughs> UIs this way and you have a little pencil to kind of uh, pick the little things that were to be picked, right? But it's unusable, right? So you can't have UI acting the same way as on the desktop, right? Um, so what, what can you do? Well, you, you basically have a kind of a screen um, and you can do um, very limited amount of interaction on a single screen, right? Did any of you use um, GPRS web services on the old Nokia phones? Like, did you have like uh, a Nokia phone or like an old fashioned phone which had internet? You had, so what, what, how the UI looked like? Yeah. That's right. So first of all, you had to click through everything through buttons. Then the, the functionality was very limited, right? So you basically, the, the, you were limited to some two or three choices and like one entry field, and that was it, right? You couldn't do much. Um, on modern phones, you kind of can do a little bit more, but you're still limited, right? So what it means is you have to limit, the, like if the user sees something, you have to limit it to kind of uh, one or two or three things at the time, and then you have to move to the next one, right? So those, uh, those systems were kind of like this. What it basically meant is um, you had a massive number of screens, um, which were extremely simple, and it kind of looked like I started uh, with the console, and OK button and one entry field. And you type something here. And then you can cancel or you can go to the next screen. If you go to the next screen, again, maybe you have two things and two buttons. And you kind of use keys to kind of navigate this. And then you go to the next screen. And again, you have one thing and two buttons. And then to achieve something, you kind of go to the billion of windows, but because you couldn't squeeze in more on a single screen, right? So it, it is kind of similar here. But there is a concept of um, you basically have the screen, and then when the user interacts with the screen, the app kind of takes over the entire screen, right? We don't have kind of a windowing system on our phones where we have 
one window doing something, another window doing something, and another window doing something because not, there is not enough space. On the tablet, we kind of introduced that, uh, but it's not like the, the windowing system we have from desktop, right? Where you can move things around and you can interact, blah, 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 right? So what, what we tend to do is we tend to have an app which effectively takes over the entire screen, and then you have the concept of the what was there before if you click the back button, right? So you have another screen, which is the screen before this appears, and then you can get there using the back button, right? And then when this thing takes over, you kind of interact with it, right? So here we have the first uh, concept, which is activity. Activity is basically the thing which takes over the screen and kind of shows some UI to, to, to you, and then you interact with it, right? Uh, so it's a user-facing part of the application which has some sort of logic and some sort of UI, right? Uh, and that UI basically takes over the screen. So this is an activity. And historically, you have this activity, and then let's say you have uh, function which, which takes you here, OK button, which will take you to the next activity. <coughs> Uh, you have another activity which again takes over the screen and it has something here with the interact, right? Um, and the activity and the screen were kind of the same thing. Uh, but we, we realized that um, when, when we have more real estate, when we have a tablet, for example, we may have, or if we turn the phone around, um, so let's say I have uh, an email application. So an email application, typically what happens is you have uh, two things, right? You have a list of emails, and then the other thing is you have the details, so the subject, uh, to fields, from fields, and the actual text of that message, right? So if I have a small device, I have one activity which shows me the list, I click, okay, I want details of this one, then this, the whole thing disappears, and I have the details of the, of the email. And then if I press the back button, I go back to the list, I click this one, and so on, right? But if I have a tablet, or if I turn the phone around, then maybe what I can have is I have the list here, and I have the, the, the two from and the, the details here, right? Then I can have it. So, but... Remember, this is one activity, right? So because what I see is one activity, but I have two elements, we kind of decouple what is usually appearing on the screen and what kind of runs behind it, and we have a concept of the fragment. So, fragment. So what is a fragment? The fragment is part of the activity which is visible on the screen. So this is a fragment. This is a fragment, and here I have a single activity, but two fragments, right? So activity is something which manages fragments, and activity is something which always occupies the whole screen and takes over the interaction with the user, but it can have, it can be composed of more than one fragment. Historically, activity was the fragment, and to move to the next screen, you have to change the activity, but now we have a fragment manager, and it allows you to compose the fragment without changing the underlying activity. What it means is I can have a single activity here, and then it can change the fragment that is visible without disappearing, without leaving the screen, or if I turn around the phone, I can have a single activity which has two fragments. Yeah? Again? In MSU, it's on the so you have a new group, which is just layout. Yeah. Then you have new objects, which is frequent, which is the same as a new object. Yeah, so, so views and view groups and view objects is something which is below fragments. Oh, okay. Right? So you will create, so if, if this is an activity which has a fragment, um, fragment manager, which manages fragments, and this is your fragment. Inside the fragment, you have to lay out the components, the visual components, the buttons and stuff. And those are views and view groups and view managers. Right? So that, this happens in the canvas. So here you have the canvas of the fragment. And then you can either draw it, like you draw on a 3D field by drawing lines and so on. Or you can use components and view groups and so on. And that's, 
that's what happens here. Kind of contextually, does it make sense? So you have an activity which is always something which is like something that the user interacts with through visual elements, but that kind of sits behind the scene and manages what the interactions are and what the visual appearance is. Then between that layer and the user, there are fragments, and then the fragments comp are composed of the views and view groups. So that's the activity. If you have a music player, maybe you, you start playing a music and then the music continues to play, but you click the back button and whatever was on the foreground disappears, right? And you don't see it anymore. But the service continues to run, right? So a service is the component, which is basically like activity, which is something the user can interact with, but that thing doesn't have a UI on its own, right? Uh, ah, about the, the, the UI also. So I have on Android, I have a home button, um, home screen, um, home, oops. home screen, when it starts, you have a home screen. And then by clicking an icon, you launch this activity of the app that you want, and this activity takes over and it shows up, right? And then I have kind of a, an activity which I launch. Let's say I launch a web browser, right? I have a web browser here. And then I kind of uh, press back button, so I go back to my home screen, right? And then if I show me, okay, show me all the running apps, I can see that the, the activity for web browser is still there, I can select it, right? If I start something new, like if I, for example, I'm not running a web browser, I'm running some app, and this app opens a web browser, and then I press the back button from the web browser, I usually go back to the one. So it forms like a stack. The activities are kind of stacked on top of each other, and they are shown to the user, and then the back button kind of catches them from the stack, right? And then uh, eventually I will go get back to the home, um, home screen. With services, we basically don't have UI, so we kind of have a machinery to, to run some logic, but without the UI. And then there are two extra um, elements which we build our applications with. Uh, content providers and broadcast receivers. <clears throat> so content provider is, uh, yeah, so I kind of had a nice slides about those uh, fragments and the activities. Um, so services is like music ser service, so they don't provide any user interface and they kind of uh, are usually attached to some other activity, right? So you need an activity to kind of start the service, but then you can detach it and it runs in the background and then you can reattach it if you need to. So for example, a lot of running apps are like this. You start it by saying, okay, uh, like um, I want to track my steps. I want to track my um, distance by GPS. And then you can kind of uh, go close your phone or go out of the app. The app will continue running in the background. Um, so content provider is basically uh, a facade. Do you know a facade pattern from object-oriented programming? If you have, uh, like we did use it for, uh, for cloud. For example, we had a student storage uh, and then we said from the application layer, we, we said new student and fetch the student. But the way the students were stored was either in memory or in REST service or in uh, SQL database, right? or in Mongo. So if you have an API which isolates you from how the data is stored, this is like a facade. Uh, and a uh, content provider is basically a facade pattern for storing data on Android phones. Um, so the, the backend can be a file system, can be SQL, can be a web REST service, whatever. But the API kind of allows you to separate how you store data from how you access the data. Um, it's easy conceptually. It's not that easy to, to do, but uh, we will use um, facilities uh, which make it kind of easy. And then we have broadcast. So what are broadcasts? Well, we need some event system on the platform. So for example, when battery is get, getting low, you have to tell all the running apps that, look, the battery is running low. You need to tidy things up or whatever, right? When the user turns the screen off, you have to tell the, the main app, look, the user just turned the screen off. Maybe whatever you are doing really battery intensive, you don't need to do anymore because the user doesn't see the screen anymore, right? Um, 
network goes off, networks comes back, uh, GPS uh, notification comes in that you have the better lo location so, um, accuracy, whatever. So you have those events, right? So a broadcast are basically those events which the system announces and broadcast receiver is a piece of code which says, <clears throat> I'm interested in those notifications. I'm interested in battery notifications. I'm interested in when the SMS comes, right? If you write an app which needs to do something with the incoming SMS, you have to register a broadcast receiver for SMSs. And then every time an SMS comes, there is a system notification saying, oh, a new SMS arrived. And then those apps which are registered as broadcast receiver for that type of event will get a notification, right? Do you get it? Yeah? That's right, yeah. So some of it is linked to this to this question. We will talk about permission system later on. Uh, those are kind of a core components, but some of them are linked to those particular events which the system has. And then you either can or cannot register uh, for those events, right? <coughs> exactly. Uh, it's, e even, with the, um, even with the act of launching an app, launching an app is not anything else by but you're pressing the icon, the home screen gets the, the, the press, checks, okay, which app you pressed, and it issues a launch broadcast to that app to launch it. And each, lap, each app has a broadcast receiver for getting a notification about the launch event, and it launches itself, right? <clears throat> so we have those four components, and those components uh, I used to build the application and the main one is the activity and the activity has, has a certain life cycle and the life cycle basically is like methods which you overwrite which get called by the system when the certain things happen so when you launch the application on create happens <clears throat> and then on start happens and then when the user closes the screen or presses the back button on pause um, is called and then if the app is not re-instantiated for a long time, the operating system can call on stop and on destroy on, the, on, on your activity. Um, and it basically shows you in which order and what happens when. So tomorrow, actually not tomorrow, next week when you go to the lab and you kind of generate a simple app for the button presses and so on, you will see that we usually overwrite on create and uh, on resume and then in on pause and on destroy we kind of uh, tidy up we clean up the memory and we kind of uh, shut down the app <clears throat> all right so we uh, we went really fast through some of the basics uh, more details are on the videos do the android videos first so do this um, next week first um, oops this one so did, what we did was this introduction to Android. You can watch the, the videos from last year uh, where I'm a little bit more uh, detailed. And then those of you who never had Java, please do this part. And then tomorrow what we will do, you will talk a little bit more about Android and Kotlin. Uh, and then next week we'll have a lab with, where we play with Android Studio, with some UI elements, with some activities and Kotlin. And those of you who never had Java, we will play with Java, okay? So that's it. Do you have questions? All right, so thank you very much.